Hello, and welcome to SoberCast, where we provide AA speaker meetings and workshops in podcast format. We're an ad-free podcast, and if you enjoy listening, please help us be self-supporting by visiting SoberCast.com, look for the donate link, and drop a dollar or two into our virtual basket. We hope you enjoy the podcast. Have a great day. Hi, my name's Michael. I'm an alcoholic, female alcoholic. I better (laughs) don't want to forget that. Um, I guess I ought to tell you two things. First of all, do you know why this book, 62, isn't on 62? Uh, In the first edition, it was 179 pages instead of 164. And that's because number one started out with doctor's opinion. And I think it should be that way today. That's my personal opinion. So if you ever get to vote (laughs) at World Service... Okay, and uh, for, your, for the, how many of you are familiar with the camels? Okay, a lot of you. How many are not familiar with the camel? Wow. Well, the camel was sent to Bill Wilson in 1948. If you go to Stepping Stones, you'll see the original camel on the man, mantle. Of, this is where he lived. And the plaque on the camel says that the camel gets on its knees twice a day, once in the morning to pick up its load, once in the evening to let go of its load, and it goes 24 hours without a drink. So since 1948, it's been used a lot in Alcoholics Anonymous, especially in California. And I know I've been places where they haven't heard about it, and I know it's just due to old-timers and how much they stick around the program when they start feeling too bad to be going to meetings, and that's when we need to be calling them up and going and picking them up. Uh, that's what I used to do. <laughs> I'm saying that because I'm I'm old now. (laughs) I want someone to take me to a meeting. (laughs) Anyway, um, I'm going to share. Can I use this? this Yeah, I'm just going to share. You know, what she just read uh, when we took such a position, what position is she talking about taking when we quit playing God? All sorts of remarkable things follow. But um, I want to just talk about one story before I get into my story. And thank you, Pat. I'm so glad, there she is, I'm so glad you mentioned about drunk lugs because I feel the same way. I feel like a newcomer cannot identify with all the spiritual stuff you're going to throw at them. I mean, they identify with the, the drunk log, and I think it's important to share that. And because of that, I changed my whole talk tonight. <laughs> You guys are going to hear the same old talk. That's what you're going to hear. Um, How many of you were here last year? Golly, look at that. That says a lot. How many were not here last year? Okay. Awesome. Okay, well then I'm going to share something I wasn't going to share. And I like to share it because it makes me laugh. I hope it makes Patty laugh. <laughs> it's a true story. It's uh, about a woman that uh, I sponsor and somebody she sponsors. And the girl that she sponsors called her up and said she was ready to go to treatment. And uh, Lynn was at work. She couldn't leave right away, so she said she'd be there in two hours. Well, giving this woman two hours to think is not really a good idea. But this is a woman that uh, when she drinks, she can't control her bladder. And she can't drink and drive, so she gave up driving. And I can understand that. So anyway, now she's thinking about going to treatment. And she decides in her keen thinking that she'd better get to the liquor store and stock up her apartment for when she gets home from treatment. (laughs) I understand that. I get that. So uh, she uh, is very considerate. So she put on a Depends. So she didn't want to have an accident in the cab. She takes cabs everywhere. And she (laughs) took this cab, bought all of her alcohol, and came back, and she's unloading it. And and, uh, Lynn pulls right in back of her and notices she's pulling out these big bottles of vodka. And she's not about to spend two hours driving her to treatment when she's stocking up her apartment. But Lynn's very considerate also, so she decided she'd go help her take her stash upstairs. So Lynn gets out of the car, and she's helping her take all this stuff up to her apartment. But the girl bent over to pick up a bottle of vodka, and that's the first time Lynn was aware that she wore Depends. 
And these depends were clearly full. <laughs> Do you know what a baby's diaper looks like? You know, <laughs> well, it looks just like a baby's diaper. It's clearly full. And <laughs> when Lynn was telling me about it, I, I <laughs> was just the last thing. I mean, I identified with this girl the whole time. But <laughs> the thing I couldn't identify with, with was when Lynn told me she bent over and she saw these depends. Over her depends, she had on a thong. <laughs> She was hot. <laughs> I, mean, I don't know. <laughs> but uh, listen up, girls, that could be us. <laughs> Take another drink and you don't know what's waiting out there for us. <laughs> anyway, uh, back to 63, it gives the um, third step prayer. So I'm going to just read it and talk a little bit about it. Um, When I got to this program and I walked into my very first meeting and they read those steps, when they read one, two, and three, I knew beyond a shadow of a doubt I had already taken those steps. I had already taken one, two, and three without even knowing it. And um, I don't know if other people are like that. I've never heard anybody else share that. But I was at that place of, you know, incomfort incomprehensible demoralization and I woke up on my front room floor one more time naked laying in a puddle of fluid don't know what the fluid was and I took those first three steps and I didn't even know what they were but I knew I couldn't do this one more day I just couldn't do it one more day and I knew I was powerless over alcohol and my life had never ever been manageable I already believed that a power greater than myself could restore me to sanity because I had had a spiritual experience long before that. And this was my way of turning my will and my life over to the care of God as I just got on my knees. And I said, God, please, I don't care how you do it, but please just get me sober. And I managed to get to a telephone. I called a prayer line that was affiliated with the church I was in. And I asked them to pray for me because, which I haven't shared with you yet, which I will. I knew with what I had done to the church and the minister that God was not. That God, that God wasn't going to listen to my prayers. But these are good people. And so I thought maybe he would listen to their prayers. And so I asked them to pray for me. And they prayed for me for 30 days. And within 30 days, I was sober. But it was just so crystal clear to me that I had taken those steps. And I have since, in my early sobriety, taken those steps in a formal manner. But it didn't make any difference. I had felt, to the bottom of my heart, I had taken those to the best of my ability when I got on my knees in my front room. And um, so, the third step prayer says... uh, it might help if I turn out a doctor's opinion on 62. Okay. 63, sorry. Uh, we were now at step three. Many of us said to our maker as we understood him, God, I offer myself to thee, to build with me and to do with me as thou wilt. To me, that sentence, that, that just meant I was at the point of surrender. I was, my way did not work. Nothing I'd ever done had worked. And I have surrendered, and I'm totally turning my will and my life over to the care of God. And I heard a speaker say that will is thoughts and life is actions. So I turn my thoughts on a daily basis to God, and I turn my actions to the best of my ability to God. I was much better at doing this in my early sobriety. I have to tell you, 34 years of sobriety, I have found myself making some mistakes because... I didn't go to God first with this prayer, because this prayer just always sets me straight. Relieve me of the bondage of self, because it's all about me, that I may better do thy will. Take away my difficulties. And that doesn't mean just difficulties with alcohol. It doesn't say difficulties with alcohol. Take away my difficulties mean God can take away all our difficulties. 
the ones that were willing to surrender. That victory over them may bear witness to those I would help of thy power, thy love, thy way of life. May I do thy will always. And there's no amen. So I've had some old timers tell me that um, there's no amen because the seventh step prayer is a continuation of the third step prayer. Have you ever heard that, Patty? I think it might have been a mistake (laughs) that Bill just overlooked it, but somehow somebody's going to fix it for us. So, so, but um, because of that, I've, I always say them together. I say the third step prayer, then the seventh step prayer. And I pray for God to direct my thinking, and I pray to be divorced from selfish, dishonest, self seeking motives. And I pray to know God's will for me and the power to carry it out. Anyway, when I crawled through the doors of Alcoholics Anonymous, I had a formal ninth grade education. I didn't know how to work. I lived on welfare. I was reduced to prostitution, and I was a thief. And all of that was before I took that first drink at the age of 25. (laughs) 25. I swore I was never going to be an alcoholic like my mom. And I managed to not drink for 25 years. But all those things I just mentioned, I did sober. I mean, I prostituted sober. I stole sober. I did those things sober. So when I took that drink, I went downhill. It's hard to imagine. It's hard to imagine, but I really did. <laughs> you know, my mom really, really did want to be sober. I, I just miss her so much today. The, the longer I'm sober, the more I love my mom and the more I appreciate her. But that wasn't the case, especially when I got to Alcoholics Anonymous. I just hated her, and I blamed everything on her. But my mom really did want to be sober, um, she and I both tried to get sober through their religious effort, different times in different congregations, and of course the result was no. But the good news is today that very same minister that counseled me is a sober member of Alcoholics Anonymous. My mom and I both tried to recover from this disease through the psychiatric effort, different times, but we went to the same psychiatrist. Of course the result was no. But the good news today is that psychiatrists is a sober member of Alcoholics Anonymous. And I like to joke around, I like to joke around and say, I think we drove these two men to drink. <laughs> we were a pair all time. <laughs> but the truth is, and this is the truth, my mom slept with the psychiatrist and I slept with the minister. <laughs> my sponsor told me that was not exactly AA's idea of a spiritual experience. <laughs> But I was sure trying to get sober spiritually. <laughs> uh, a little bit about my background. First of all, I'm Irish, German, and Cherokee, and I'm illegitimate. And being born out of wedlock today is just not a big deal. But when I was a little growing up, a gr- little girl growing up, it was in my childhood is really appalling. So in my mom's defense, I want to tell you a little bit about her childhood because as bad as mine was, my mom's was worse. And this program gave me the ability to have a very loving relationship with my mom, even though she couldn't quit drinking. And I lost my mom 20 years ago. She died of lung cancer. I had the opportunity uh, to practice love and service at home. My sister and I took her home. We had hospice come in. And my mom actually got to die with a little bit of dignity. And I had the ability to get in bed with my mom, love her all night, hold her all night, and just love her unconditionally. And that's what you guys taught me. And that love was totally unconditional. And I had to watch her drink on top of morphine up until to the day she could no longer swallow. <laughs> when Patty was talking about salivating, what you do bar salivating, I used to have to, I was 13 years sober and I had to mix these drinks with my mom. And I would salivate. It just scared me. I would salivate really bad. I didn't want to drink. I didn't want to drink. I, I, I ran into the bedroom. I got on my knees and I prayed and I called somebody in Alcoholics Anonymous and they came in their RV and parked in front of the house for four days because I was so shook over this salivating over making these drinks for my mom. But uh, my mom came from an alcoholic background and when she was 13, her mother was murdered by a drunken brawl by a 
murdered in a drunken brawl. A drunk slit my grandmother's throat, and that left my mom out on the streets at the age of 13 trying to raise herself because her father was in a chain gang, which is some kind of prison. At the age of 14, she had a first baby, which she gave up for adoption, and then she had me, and she did everything in her power to keep me. She later met this man, got married, had three boys, and we all moved to California. That marriage soon ended in divorce, and my stepfather moved back to Colorado. So that left my uh, mother in California trying to raise four little kids, and we were raised on welfare. We were raised in extreme, extreme poverty, always having lights, gas, telephones turned off, always being evicted, even having to sleep in cars. And then I had to deal with my mom's prostitution. I had to deal with her alcoholism, and I had to deal with all of her suicide attempts. When I was 12, my mom got pregnant again. And this time she sent my three younger brothers to live with their real dad in Colorado. Now, my three brothers are my very best friends. When you're sleeping in cars, you're always being evicted. You don't have an opportunity to make friends. So my brothers were my friends. So I feel like at the age of 12, I had all these feelings that I later brought with me to Alcoholics Anonymous. And those feelings were of low self-worth, low self-esteem, not equal to, and just not good enough. And that's a direct result of all that poverty. This drunken psychiatrist pointed out to me that I had issues of abandonment. I never knew my real dad. My stepdad went away. My three brothers went away. My mom's always trying to kill herself. And because of some other childhood experiences, I would say I'm a fear-based person. I've always been afraid of people, places, and things. And the two very important things I learned when I got to the program in Alcoholics Anonymous is, first of all, I learned that feelings are not facts. And all those things I used to think about myself were not the truth. But best of all, I learned how to walk through fear. And I learned that every time I walk through fear, I'm actually exercising faith. And this last 20 years, I've walked through two of my biggest fears. And one of them is getting up here at the podium and sharing my story. I never shared my story until I was 11 years sober. I couldn't, at four years of sobriety, read how it works from the podium. It was just the most terrifying thing for me. And the other was getting on airplanes. And it took 12 and a half years of sobriety for me to finally get on an airplane. And I found out I'm not afraid of flying. I'm afraid of crashing. <laughs> my, my sponsor said I'd better be clear of what the fear is when I'm asking God to remove it. <laughs> but I hear things in the rooms of Alcoholics Anonymous that are not in the big book. And one thing I used to hear all the time in the area where I live is that you could not have fear and faith at the same time. That if you had fear, you didn't have any faith. And I couldn't figure out what I was doing wrong in my program because I've had spiritual experiences. But I still had all this fear. And I finally walked over to this, this man who would, would pass out a coin that said faith on one side, fear on the other side. And I said, what am I doing wrong in my program? I still have all this fear. And he told me in the most smug, arrogant way, Sometimes old-timers are like that. <laughs> Most of my arrogant way he said, it sounds to me like you haven't taken a thorough third step. Today, I know I have taken a thorough third step. Going back to step three, it's a process. It's not a prayer you say. It's not something you hand up and take back. The third step to do a thorough third step, at least for me, is you have to take those actions of four through nine. That's the process of doing a thorough third step. Um, I went over to one of these old timers that was real instrumental in my sobriety, and uh, I was telling on this other guy what I was doing. <laughs> he was crying on his shoulder, and he said, I haven't taken a thorough third step because I'm so afraid. And basically what Bill told me, he says, nowhere in the big book does it say you cannot, cannot have fear and faith at the same time. And he took me to page 68. Of course, it's under the fear inventory. And he pointed out a sentence to me. And that sentence says, all men of faith have courage. All men of faith have courage. And then he pointed out to me, you don't need courage unless you're afraid. And then he took me down to the bottom of that paragraph. And it gives you that little fear prayer. God, remove my fear and direct my attention to what you have me be. And I'm always to... I'm always directed to work with another person in the program or out of the program. If I can get out of me, God can take care of whatever it is I'm afraid of. The next sentence says that once we commence to outgrow fear, it does not say it once we outgrow fear. It says we commence to outgrow fear. So I'm 34 years sober and I'm still commencing. 
But the deal is today, I don't let it paralyze me any longer. I walk through whatever it is I'm afraid of. That's how I started getting on airplanes. The first time I was dropped off at the airport to speak at my first AA convention, the girl that was going to boot me on the plane had an emergency and she had to leave, so she just dropped me off at LAX. And I am terrified. I started going to a panic attack because I've had... I've had panic attacks in the past. My legs shook so bad, I fell back into a chair because I couldn't stand, and I'm hyperventilating. But when I fell back into the chair, I started crying, and I don't know, the chair seemed to release it or something. I had an inner voice talk to me. It was a spiritual experience of the kind that I have. And it's an inner voice. It's loud and it's clear, but it's not through the ears. And this voice wasn't very kind either. (laughs) And this voice always calls me Michael. Now, if I'm thinking it, I don't think I don't say Michael, but this voice always calls me Michael. And uh, he just went, Michael, why don't you get out of yourself and try and help somebody? And I just remember being startled. You know, and I just, what? This isn't an AA meeting. <laughs> like, who am I going to help? And I noticed these little old ladies at, at the um, escalator that goes up to where the lights take off and they're struggling with their bags you know they were having a hard time with their bags oh I just jumped right over there (laughs) and started helping them up with their bags you know and that it was so successful that every time I had to fly I would report to the airport at the escalator like I worked there (laughs) (laughs) and I'd help all these little old ladies with their bags one of them hit me with her purse she thought I was (laughs) she thought I was trying to steal her bag and if I'm in a lot of turbulence oh I hate that I always carry pen and paper with me and I pull out out and I start writing the third step prayer and putting somebody else in it and by the time we land I had lots of people in the third step prayer (laughs) but we've always landed I'm still here so I think I'll keep doing it it seems to work anyway I'm uh, 13 years old and my mom has this baby And I had to learn how to be a mom, and I didn't even know how to be a kid. My mom's alcoholism took her out of the home, and she was never around. I had full responsibility of this baby, and she's sleeping in a dresser drawer. I eventually had to potty train her, bottle break her. I'm failing in school because I can't get to school because of this responsibility. Now, after doing my inventory, I found out the truth was I hated school anyway. (laughs) When I went to school, I was either... An object of pity around my peers, or I was teased about the way I dressed and teased about my hair. So specifically, to get out of my home life, at the age of 15, I got married. You can rack up a lot of marriages when you get married at 15. (laughs) I'm on my fourth one right now. (laughs) Seems to be working. I've been married almost 19 years, so. (laughs) Thank you. This man that I married, he was 18. He lived in the neighborhood. He came from a similar background. And I have such a colorful past that I like to brag about this. I want everyone here to know when I got married at the age of 15, I was not pregnant. (laughs) That's very important. (laughs) I was not pregnant. I had two shows I used to watch. They were my very favorite TV shows, and they were family programs, very unrealistic. Most of you are too young to remember these shows. But it was Donna Reed and Father Knows Best. And Donna Reed was so beautiful. She wore these big four-inch heels, and she wore these big, beautiful dresses with all these petticoats under it, so they were like up here. That was how she vacuumed her house. That was her vacuuming attire. So at the age of 15, I had this wild idea that I was Miss Donna Reed marrying Mr. Father Knows Best, and unfortunately it didn't turn out that way. I believe the man I married was an alcoholic. One indication, his name was Johnny Walker. (laughs) I should have had a clue. (laughs) I want to share a story with you about that sister of mine, the one that slept in the dresser drawer. Because when I got to this program, I blamed my alcoholism on my mom's alcoholism. I blamed the way it turned out on the way I was raised. After I got sober, I took a good look at that sister of mine. She came from the very same background, being illegitimate, everything. 
And she was literally forced to move out of the house at the age of 16. So she quit school, moved out. But what she did is she took that high school equivalency test. And she had to take it three times until she finally passed it. With this test under her belt, under a special youth program, she went to work for the city of Long Beach. At the age of 26, she retired from the city of Long Beach. She took her 10 years retirement pay. She bought her own business. She later married the head traffic engineer of the city of Long Beach, and they're still married. And at the age of 30, my sister was awarded Woman Entrepreneur of the Year. And she's still going strong. You know, she's 50 now and um, 51. And I just saw her on Facebook. At, she was being presented an award in Las Vegas. She works as event coordinator for Caesars Palace. And she was being presented award, an award as one of the most influential women today in Las Vegas. I couldn't believe it. You know, and, and she doesn't call and brag about it or anything like that. I have to read it on Facebook. <laughs> she's really incredible. So anyway, at the um, at the age of 15, I got married. At the age of 17, I did have a baby. At the age of 18, I had to get out of this marriage. This man took me through a whole new phase of alcoholism. I never experienced with my mom, and it's called physical abuse. And he never abused me unless he was drinking. But he abused me to the point of cutting me up with a knife, and I had to have surgery to repair the damage. So I got out of that marriage at the age of 18, and I feel like that's when I started on the road of being everything I swore I'd never be, doing everything I swore I'd never do. Hadn't even taken a drink of alcohol yet. I always intuitively knew if I took a drink, I'd be an alcoholic. But it started out with me being a single mother living on welfare. My whole life growing up like that, I swore when I grew up, I wasn't going to live like that. And there I was. On page 23 in the big book, it says, The main problem of the alcoholic centers in his mind rather than his body. So we're talking about the main problem being the mental obsession and not the physical allergy. So I know for me, I practiced my disease of alcoholism way before I ever took that first drink. And I did it in the form of compulsive overeating. I would shove food in my mouth instead of alcohol. Then I discovered that wonderful world of diet pills. And this is back in the days. There's nothing like it out today. This was pharmaceutical methadry. <laughs> so I went on this diet for 16 years. <laughs> I think I took him alcoholically. <laughs> when I finally took that first drink at the age of 25, I immediately had the physical allergy. From that very first drink, I had the phenomenon of craving. From that very first drink, I had a personality change, Dr. Jekyll and Mr. Hyde. You read about that in the big book. The big book refers to that as a real alcoholic. And I personally am so physically allergic to alcohol. When I consume alcohol, I break out in a rash, welts and hives all over my body. And I was always too drunk to have a clue that that wasn't normal. But if I'd had a clue, it wouldn't have made a difference. I drank morning, noon, and night. And I did not draw a sober breath from the age of 25 to the age of 31. And this is not an exaggeration. I had a huge spiritual experience way before I ever got to this program, and this was equivalent to the one that Bill had in Bill's story. Now, in the big book, it says, as a result of a spiritual awakening, you'll have a change in psyche, a change in attitude. It says you'll have this huge emotional displacement and rearrangement. And this spiritual experience I had was not enough for me to achieve that, and I believe it's because I did not have a plan of action to go with it. But it was enough for me to come to believe that a power greater than myself could restore me to sanity. So what I did with this experience is I sought out a very specific church. I counseled with the minister. I told him all about my spiritual experience. I shared with him all my character defects and all my shortcomings. And he assured me if I got really active in this church, and I read all these inspirational books, I did all this positive thinking and all these affirmations, that I could be everything that I ever wanted to be. After I got to this program, I heard a speaker at the podium say, if you're alcoholic, you cannot think your way into right, right actions. He said, if you're alcoholic, you have to act your way into right thinking. And I am absolute proof of that because I got really active in that church. I even became the secretary of that church. I struggled reading those books because I could barely read. I did all that positive thinking, all of those affirmations. And the only thing that resulted is I ended up having a torrid affair with this minister, and it absolutely infuriated his wife. <laughs> 
The rest of the congregation wasn't too excited about it either. Well, they were excited, but it wasn't the right kind of excited. When I got to this program, I heard that laughter was healing, and I always thought my story was just much too serious. And when I got here, I used to hang out at the very back of the room, and I have a friend named Teddy, and she calls the back of the room the half-measure section or the denial section. (laughs) And I didn't hang out back there for either of those reasons. I hung out back there because I couldn't read very well, and I was terrified they would ask me to read something. And I literally could not say the word anonymity for over six months, and that's with lessons. It took me six months to be able to say that word. So I'd always hide out in the back of the room. And uh, in California, we have funny speakers. You know, they're just really funny. And they would share something funny, and everybody would burst into laughter. And I, I just didn't think it was funny. I just I had those pursed lips. On. I just didn't think any of this was funny. About two years of sobriety under my belt, somebody got up at the podium and shared something, and I had the biggest belly laugh that I had ever had. And after I stopped laughing, I found myself thinking, well, that might be funny for you, but there's nothing, absolutely nothing in my background I could ever laugh at. And it was um, my second time to ever give an AA talk. Oh, my first one was really pathetic. Oh, boy, I wanted to commit suicide afterwards. It was just really (laughs) pathetic. But I had a sponsor who was encouraging me to talk because I had done a lot. I had accomplished a lot in my first 10 years of sobriety. And uh, But I always use that excuse, where in the big book does it talk about being a speaker? Huh? (laughs) Show me. You show me and I'll do it. (laughs) But she was really sick one day, and so I went in her place. Just a little meeting in Long Beach. And... um, that's the one that I wanted to commit suicide. So I went home and I said, I just said to God, I said, okay, God, if you want me to do this in Alcoholics Anonymous, you're going to have to lighten up my story because I'm not going to live long enough to tell it. And um, so the second time I ever shared my story, my, my daughter wanted to come hear me. Um, my daughter had been in and out of the program. She, at the age of 15, got sober and at the age of 18, she and her girlfriend were leaving an AA dance. She, um, a man came up to these two girls with a gun and forced these girls in the car and kidnapped them. Brutally raped my daughter for over two hours, knocked the other girl totally unconscious, and uh, brutally raped my daughter for over two hours. And he was drunk. He had a bottle of alcohol in his pocket, thank God, because he was quite inebriated. And when he was forced into the trunk of the car, she uh, managed to keep just catch him off guard and she just turned around and got him in the face. He fell down, the gun slid under the car and she ran down the street and Nathan got away. He took off with the car and later rolled the other girl out in the street. So both girls lived, but the road of recovery was really hard and it was really long. My daughter and I felt absolutely betrayed. She drank again and I managed to stay sober. Um, I wanted to leave Alcoholics Anonymous and I wanted to leave God but I managed to stay sober and start seeking God at a different level. So the only thing I can tell you that I know about God today, and this is from many spiritual experiences that I reached this point, is that God is good, good is God, and if it's not good, it's not of God. But I was uh, speaking at my second meeting. My daughter's trying to get sober one more time, and she does have 21 years now. Thank you. (laughs) Um, so she decided she wanted to come to the meeting and hear me speak and so before the meeting she brought some of her program girlfriends over to the house and we sat down we had coffee then she proceeded to tell all of her girlfriends my drunkalog and for some reason it was just a little funnier coming out of her mouth than out of my head and of course she's telling these girls all about the minister And that I'm dragging her off to church every day. And she's learning things like the Ten Commandments, the Golden Rule. I'm constantly preaching all this religious stuff to her. She comes home from school at 3 o'clock in the afternoon, and she opens the bedroom door, and there, naked, in bed with her mom, was the married minister of the church. Now, when she first said this, I just looked at her, and I, I mean, I had all those appropriate feelings. I felt shame, guilt, remorse, embarrassment, all of it. And I just looked at my daughter, and in the most sympathetic way, I said, God, honey, that had to be a terrible shock. (laughs) 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 
sorry. <laughs> I used to cry at this part, and now I laugh. <laughs> How does that happen? <laughs> She just looked at me and she said, no, Mom, I don't know what shocked me the most, seeing that minister naked or seeing his artificial leg on the floor. (laughs) I totally forgot he had a, a, I mean, it was a huge artificial leg. I don't know how I forgot it. (laughs) It was very interesting watching him hop to the bathroom. (laughs) I've never said that at the podium. I'm sorry. (laughs) Oh, God. (laughs) You know, uh, somebody, I didn't know that you could pull up your name on Google and they'll show all the tapes that you've done. Well, somebody was showing me, yeah, look, Michael Earl's AA speaker, da da da. And they pulled up the mess of tapes and then they described a sentence I only said one time in my whole life. And that's what I'm known for. <laughs> and that is, um, I was seeking spirituality by injection. <laughs> I couldn't believe it. I couldn't believe it. You know, one of my favorite steps besides step 12 is step 9. And step 9 is the amends step, the step where we make restitution. And I call step 9 the freedom step. This is the step that truly freed me from the bondage of my past. And it's just not a coincidence that in the big book, those promises come after step 9. And it says before you're halfway through, you're going to know a new freedom and a new happiness. It says you won't regret, regret the past or wish to shut the door on it. And so on and so on. And I did not have to wait to get halfway through step nine, thank God, because it took me 12 years to complete that list. But that happened to me with my very first amends, and that was going back to that church and telling that minister I used to steal from the church funds. And he told me he knew that. Then I had to tell him I used to steal out of his wallet when he was in the shower. He told me he did not know that. (laughs) So I immediately made restitution to him, but I had to set up a payment schedule to pay back the church. Mm -hmm. But at that time, he shared with me, he knew exactly what I was doing. By the time I got to him, he had two years of sobriety in the program of Alcoholics Anonymous. When he lost his leg in that motorcycle accident, he was an alcoholic and a drug addict, and he actually died on the operating table. He had one of those near-death experiences, which for him was his spiritual experience, and even he could not get sober in church. I'm not putting down churches. I'm not putting down the psychiatric effort because I know it works for some people. I just think if God gets us sober here, this is where he wants us to do our work. So I'm kicked out of this church. (laughs) I'm 27 years old. Now I'm full on into my drinking. I'm living in another apartment. I'm being evicted from my normal M.O., Lights and gas had been turned off for a long time, but I still had a telephone. It was a working priority. And <laughs> most people never catch that. You guys know. <laughs> you caught that. It's a working priority. And I got this call at 11 o'clock at night, and I could not believe the man on the other end of this phone. It was my, my real dad. And he wanted to make amends for not being in my life. He wanted to get to know me, and he wanted to get to know my daughter. So he offered me an opportunity to move to Colorado to get to know his whole family and I didn't want to go I didn't have any desire to get to know him I really loved my stepfather but I mostly didn't want to move to the snow at that point in my life I had nowhere to go except for out on the streets and I think deep down inside I had a little hope if I did that geographic maybe I could change so I moved to to Colorado and I lived there for three months and in that three month period this man and his family could not wait to kick me out of the state of Colorado In that three-month period, I ended up having affairs with the bus drivers on the way over there, getting pregnant, having an abortion, falling down the stairs and breaking my leg, ripping off his medicine cabinet, ripping off his booze cabinet, and ripping off his money. So they literally kicked me out of the state of Colorado. 
I'll tell you how I broke that leg. <laughs> Obviously, I was drunk. And in the neighborhood where I li- lived, the liquor stores all closed at 12. I didn't have a cart, but I had to make my final liquor run because it was almost 12. And we had had ice storms, and it was snowing, and the stairs were very icy. And I'm drunk, so I'm walking down the stairs, holding on to the railing with my right hand, and my nine-year-old daughter's on the other side of me, the left side of me, trying to hold me up. And all of a sudden, I... I noticed another second floor apartment. I was, I lived on the second floor and I noticed another second floor apartment. The door just opened. I don't know what this guy was doing there, but this man walked out the door and he's definitely a man of God. He has a collar, the robe, everything. He's a man of God and I'm very angry at God. I'm angry at God because I just seduced his minister and ripped off his church. So now I'm mad at God. And I looked up at that priest, and I flipped up my middle finger. Let's go to the railing to do it. Flipped up my middle finger, and I said, F you, God. And I immediately fell down the stairs and broke my leg. (laughs) My daughter told me that is the day she started believing in a punishing God. (laughs) Today, we both know it had nothing to do with God, I felt, because I was drunk. So my real dad is second on my list of amends to make when I started making my amends, and I wrote him a letter, and I told him that I was sober in the program of Alcoholics Anonymous, and I made, wanted to make restitution for my behavior up there, and I sent him a check trying to set up a payment schedule. And basically what he and the family did is they sent me the check back with a little note that said they didn't want my money and they never want to hear from me again. I was working with a sponsor, so of course I stayed sober, but I really did want to make these amends. And with my sponsor's encouragement on just taking the actions of a good daughter, on every Father's Day and on every birthday, I would send him an appropriate card. And I would tell him I was still sober in the program of Alcoholics Anonymous, and I still wanted to make restitution. I did this for five or six, seven years. I don't know how many years I did this. And he never acknowledged me. Finally, the last time I sent off a card, within a few days, I got a reply in the mail. I mean, I saw the return address on that envelope. And I cannot tell you how excited I was. I ripped open the envelope, and the only thing that was in it was a picture of his tombstone and the obituary out of the newspaper. He just died. And that was the family's way of telling me not to bother trying anymore. And there are no words to express the kind of pain I felt. You would have thought I knew him my whole life, and I didn't, but I took it real, real hard. And the people in Alcoholics Anonymous pointed out to me I don't make amends for approval. The big book tells me I don't make amends to be forgiven. I make amends to clean up my side of the street. I make amends to stay sober. So all I can tell you is that the actions I took worked. Because not once, not even once, was I ever tempted to drink over that rejection. I'm just so sorry he didn't get to know the person I'm today because I know he would have been proud. So I've been kicked out of this church. Now I'm kicked out of the state. Living back in Long Beach, California, across the street from Franklin Junior High. Gang-related school. My daughter's now 14 years old. She's running with a very dangerous gang. I'm doing awful, humiliating, embarrassing things to my daughter, but I wasn't only embarrassing my daughter, I was embarrassing this entire gang. And uh, <laughs> Oh, it's just so true. <laughs> I lived in an apartment I was being evicted from. Lights, gas, and telephone had all been turned off for a long time. Had dark, those thick drapes. I kept them closed so the landlord wouldn't know I was there because he was always trying to serve me an eviction notice. So with uh, no lights and no electricity and no sun, nothing, my apartment's dark. It's dark day and night. My apartment's so dark that now I'm seeing evil spirits. Unless you've seen them, they're hard to describe. But these evil spirits would do things like follow me around the house, and then in turn I would crawl out of the house on my hands and knees, butt naked across the street to the school ground, and warn my daughter and her gang friends not to come home to houses possessed with evil spirits. And this is the kind of stuff I did that makes me wish to God I was a blackout drinker. <laughs> but I'm not a blackout drinker. I get to remember it all. Thank God it was the back of the school and not the front of the school. All the neighbors felt sorry for my daughter. They would feed her. They would hide her out. Sometimes they would feed me. We were next door at the neighbor's house, and she was fixing food for everybody including me. And um, as we were sitting there, something happened outside a car accident or something. My neighbor and my daughter went to check it out. And I lagged behind because on her counter she had a bottle of 100-proof vodka. I only thought it came in 80-proof, so I was very impressed. And uh, 
I was always promising my daughter I wouldn't drink, so I had to do this real fast so she wouldn't see me. I don't know how much I drank or how fast I drank it, but I drank it right out of the bottle. I do know it was enough to stop my respiratory system. At that point, I stopped breathing. And I can remember the sensation I couldn't breathe, and it's the last thing I remember. I don't remember the paramedics. I don't remember being rushed to the hospital or resuscitated. By the time I had any memory, I woke up in the hospital bed with both arms, you know, strapped down because um, I guess I was pretty violent. Uh, a nurse had just slapped me in the face because I was trying to bite her and I was spitting at her. So um, this experience did get my attention. This time I almost died under the influence of alcohol, and it scared me. I didn't want to die out there, and the main reason I didn't want to die out there is I didn't want to do to my daughter all the things that I had gone through with all the ambulances, all the police, all the drama, all the chaos. I just didn't want to do that to her. So I finally started listening to her because she used to tell me on a daily basis, she would say, Mom, if you wouldn't drink, you wouldn't do those things. She said, just smoke pot. So (laughs) this is my only experience smoking pot, but I'm trying really hard not to drink. And um, I don't have any friends of my own, so I smoke this pot with my daughter and her friends. And... (laughs) Afterwards, we're walking down the street, and I have on these tight, tight jeans, and I have my hands shoved down in my pockets. I don't know if I tripped over a crack or tripped over my own foot, but I tripped, and I started to go down. I don't know if any of you have been on pot, but for me, it was different. First of all, I had the feeling I was in slow motion, and I had the sensation that the cement was coming up at my face. And this is what I remember the most. I tried so hard to get my hands out of my pockets, and I couldn't get my hands out of my pockets. So you've you've got to picture this grown woman laying with her face smashed in cement. Her hands are still sticking out of her pockets. And all the gang members were laughing hysterically. They were just, they were just hysterical. I mean, I wasn't laughing, but I could hear them laughing. And as I heard that laughter, I had that moment of clarity. I knew right then and there, beyond a shadow of a doubt, that pot was not the answer. And I went right back to my drinking. And I drank at the same pace for a while longer, but what what finally happened for me is I reached that point in the big book, and it talks about facing those hideous four horsemen, terror, bewilderment, frustration, and despair. And I already told you about waking up on that front room floor and taking those first three steps. And um, so in that 30-day period that these people are praying for me, I'm trying hard not to drink. I didn't know what to do with myself. I'm starting to go through delirium tremens, so I went over to my mom's house. Why my mom? I don't know. She's drinking, but she was very sympathetic. And the mayor of Signal Hill was driving past her house, and he remembered her from when she was in AA. Um, that's, uh, that's where I'm so glad I told God I didn't care how he did it, how he got me sober, because the one thing I wouldn't do is go to AA. Never. My mom proved to me it didn't work. She hung around with some sleazy AA men, was also sleazy AA women. People in here are just taking up space. They don't care about the 12 steps. They don't care about the 12 traditions, and they don't care about your anonymity. And um, that was my mom and the people she hung around with. I was 12 years old, and two men made serious passes at me, these AA men. And so that's what I thought about the men in Alcoholics Anonymous. I would never have come here. But I was so physically sick, and the mayor of Signal Hill tried to talk my mom into going to a meeting, and she wouldn't go. She didn't want to get sober. And so he worked on me about one second. I was so willing to do anything. And so I went to this meeting with him. It was behind the, the jail in Signal Hill. He and his um, friend made me wait in the parking lot. They ran across the street, and they bought two beers. And they came back, and they made me drink them before the meeting. I remember thinking, hmm, he's not too bad. <laughs> No, I just didn't know why they were making me drink it. And uh, anyway, but it did exactly what they wanted it to do. I wasn't so sick, and I could hear what people said in the meeting. And there was a girl there that I identified with. And she said, and I've never heard anybody say anything like this, she said her whole life growing up, some kids wanted to be doctors, some kids wanted to be lawyers. First of all, what she said is she said that she practiced her disease of alcoholism way before she ever took that first drink. And she did it in the form of compulsive overeating and amphetamine abuse. That's the first thing that got my attention. And then she said, 
Some kids want to be doctors, some kids want to be lawyers, but all I ever wanted to do when I grow up was just not to be an alcoholic like my mom. And I just started to cry. I mean, the tears just streamed down my face, and I just couldn't stop. I cried throughout the rest of the meeting. That's the first time in my life I ever felt like I belonged anywhere on this planet. And I'm just so thankful we didn't have people that put you out the door because you mentioned the drug, you know, because I don't know what that would have done to me if I'd seen them do that to her. You know, but um, that was my last drink. That was November 10th, 1979. But I don't celebrate my birthday for three more months um, because I continue to do those diet pills because AA, AA has no opinion on outside issues. And, <laughs> and that is an outside issue. <laughs> but I started doing my fourth step. And when you're on speed, you can do a really fast fourth step. <laughs> But what that fourth step did for me is it revealed to me that I was not sober if I was abusing these pills. So I gave those up January 23rd, 1980. Um, Last story I'm going to share with you. Well, I'll let you know I was six months sober. I had a sponsor. She told me I had to get a job. I had to be fully self-supporting for my own contributions. I don't know how to work. I went out there and I got my first job, and that's where I learned how to work. I learned things like how to get there every day, how to get there on time, how to not leave early, how to only take a 30-minute lunch break. I didn't know how to do those things other than here in Alcoholics Anonymous. I stayed, I stayed there full-time for eight years. I stayed on another two years part-time after I took another full-time position. So I was there for a total of ten years, and I had worked myself up to assistant administrator. What I did for the next six years, I went to work for a musical theater industry. It was equity. It was a multi-million dollar corporation. And equity means union, that they dealt with big major stars, and um, started out in the very bottom of the accounting department. Went back to school, and within a period of time, I worked myself up to business manager at this multi-million dollar corporation. And as business manager, I dealt with millions of dollars. And this is the honest God truth. When I got to this program, I didn't have a clue how many zeros were in a million dollars. I have participated in union negotiations, and I've been invited into some of the homes of some of the most famous people you see even today on stage, screen, and TV. And today I can see myself in a picture with a very famous person, and I still get overwhelmed. I still think, how did I ever get from the gutters of Long Beach to being invited into some of these places and how that happened is I worked the last part of that 12th step and I applied these principles in all my affairs. One last story, and it's just how I came to terms with the God I have. I told you about my daughter being kidnapped. There is a sentence in the big book that I had such a hard time with. It says, absolutely nothing in God's world happens by mistake. In the third edition, it used to be called Dr. Alcoholic Addict. In the fourth edition, it's called Acceptance is the Answer. And that's a great sentence, but not if you've had a tragedy. Because to me, you know, Clancy says alcoholism, alcoholism is a disease of perception. I'm still an alcoholic. I still get my disease of perception because I perceive that to mean that if nothing in God's world happens by mistake, then that had to be an act of God. My daughter's rape had to be an act of God. And I wanted to leave Alcoholics Anonymous, and I wanted to leave God. I knew I didn't want any part of a God that could operate like that. And thank God for Bill Hennicutt. He just took me by the hand and he said, Michael, God is good and good is God. And if it's not good, it's not of God. He said, man has free will. This man was acting on his free will and your daughter was just a victim. He said, if man didn't have free will, we wouldn't all be sitting in a meeting of Alcoholics Anonymous. We'd all be perfect people. And when he told me that, I had a spiritual release and I knew he was telling me the truth. But I still had so much trouble with that sentence in the big book. I could hear someone say it about something good, and I'd feel rage, just rage. And because I have the story I have, I sponsor women that come that had suffered terrible tragedies. And one of these women, her tragedy was worse than my daughter's, made the mistake of telling me, well, it must be God's will, because in the big book it says absolutely nothing in God's world happens by mistake. This woman desperately needed comfort, and I went off on her like a crazy woman. I started screaming at her that that wasn't written by the first 100 alcoholics. It's not in the first 164 pages of the big book. I slammed the big book down. I said, it's not even in the first two editions of this book. And I made her cry. She had these huge crocodile tears coming out of her eyes. And I just, I knew that I have a problem. I have a resentment about something in the big book, but it's not only hurting me. Now it's hurting other people. And because it was hurting other people, I really came to a place of willing, being willing to give it up. 
And that's all I could do is be willing. I couldn't force myself, but I was willing. And I prayed daily for God to just help me with that sentence. And I don't know how many years ago I was with Polly. She was beginning a meeting in Long Beach. And she was sharing about a tape out by Clancy, and it's called Alcoholism, Disease of Perception. And right in that meeting when she said the words disease of perception, I had the biggest spiritual encounter that I've ever had. I couldn't see anything in the room. It was like a white fog. I couldn't hear anything Polly said. I had that inner voice loud and clear, and it said, Michael, you know what happens in the meeting of Alcoholics Anonymous is part of God's world. When, what happens when you're working those 12 steps is part of God's world. The progression of all good is part of God's world. What happened in that car nine years ago was part of man's world. And at that point, I could separate man's world from God's world, and I could come to terms with that sentence in the big book. Two weeks after that experience, I found myself sitting at a big restaurant, a lot of us having dinner, a lot of alcoholics, and I'm sitting right next to a man named Dr. Paul, who wrote that sentence in the big book. (laughs) And I was at such peace, I did not have to go off on him (laughs) and tell him exactly what I thought about that sentence. He used to get lots of letters about that sentence. He'd get lots of phone calls about that sentence. And uh, what he would do is just give him my phone number. <laughs> Actually, what he told me was that my spiritual experience was the best explanation he could think of as to why evil exists in this world. We lost him about five years ago. I, was, I don't know how long ago, but I still feel his presence when I talk about him. Anyway, um, I want to thank you for allowing me to be here. I love you women. You're just so gorgeous. It's really hard to believe you're drunk. But <laughs> thank you. Thanks for listening. I hope you enjoyed the podcast. Sobercast is ad-free, and we'd like your help in order to keep it that way. So if you'd like to help us be self-supporting by pledging a dollar to a month, visit Sobercast.com and look for the donate links. Thank you very much.